ministers, uh, members of the Sri Lankan business community and our visiting uh, businessmen from Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the Prime Minister for one of the most enjoyable evenings I had in a long time last night. Partly because, of course, Corona, we never had evenings like that. But uh, it was um, good to see um, the cultural show and, um, and, and a really relaxed evening, and not to mention the amount of food that I consumed that I haven't had for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, my motivation in politics was only one, poverty alleviation. I came, I struggled for uh, way back in um, 25, almost 25 years ago. Uh, I entered politics because I felt that the best way to reduce poverty in our country would be to set up a welfare state. Before entering politics, I had built uh, a cancer hospital in Pakistan. And the only reason to build the hospital was that poor people could not afford very, the very expensive cancer treatment. So therefore, the idea to have a cancer hospital where a, a poor person could go in and not worry about the expensive treatment. But during that uh, uh, time when I was building the hospital, I, I began to realize that in a country of right now 220 million people, the only way you can help uh, the majority of the poor people is if you build a welfare state. And so that's, that was the motivation. And today I must say, I had a very good conversation with the president uh, because I realized that he also was motivated by poverty alleviation. And so the, the current problem in Pakistan which we face is food inflation. And so we were discussing how, you know, how to uh, uh, bring down the prices of food items. And so we came up, uh, he, he told me how he went to China and he actually visited various farms from where he discovered that how the Chinese had, the, how they had reduced the gap between the wholesale and the retail. So previously, and in our country right now, what the farmers produce and what that produces sold in the retail shops, there's a huge gap. And so the Chinese reduced that gap through technology. And so I, I really, I must say, I, I thank the president because I'm immediately going to go back and bring in technology to reduce this gap. The other way we, we can reduce poverty is through investment, is through promoting profitability, business. And so that's my second uh, uh, emphasis right now. We have completely changed our policies in Pakistan, which have, which have sadly been there for almost 40 years, where um, the mindset was against profitability and, and obviously against businesses. The whole government structure, the bureaucratic structure evolved such that it was an impediment in the way of investment and, and the business community. So this whole mindset we have been trying to change in the last two years and removing all the impediments which, which uh, translates into the expression ease of doing business. And we have really improved 28 spots. We've come down, our, uh, our, our ease of doing business has improved uh, according to the World Bank. And so it, the whole idea is that we generate wealth and from that wealth, we can then spend on uh, the bottom uh, half of our population and, and lift them up from poverty, which is actually what China did. And uh, China, I must say, one thing I admire about them is that no country in human history has ever taken out almost 700 million people 
out of poverty in 30 to 35 years. It's never been done before. And so this is something uh, which, you know, uh, uh, your president and I had a long conversation. And of course, I've been emphasizing since we've come into power. So, so the reason behind backing our businesses, the business community and investment, is that if the final goal is to alleviate poverty, create wealth, alleviate poverty. Uh, the third thing you need to create wealth uh, in any country is stability, is political stability, is having good relationship with your neighbors. Because one thing which Sri Lanka and we have had in common is that whenever you have conflict or terrorism, as Sri Lanka and Pakistan suffered from, then the, the first thing that it affects is the business climate, is investment, and in your case, tourism. In Pakistan also, but our tourism, of course, is not as developed as in Sri Lanka, but tourism also gets affected, and of course, Sri Lanka has suffered from. So, immediately when I came into power, I um, approached our neighbor, India, explained to them, to uh, Prime Minister Modi, that the way forward for the subcontinent is for us to resolve our differences through dialogue and then improve our trading relationship and diffuse the tension. I didn't succeed, but I'm optimistic that eventually sense will prevail that the only way we in the subcontinent can get people out of poverty is have trading relationship, improve our trading relationship, live as civilized neighbors, neighbors like the Europeans live. Germany and France have God knows how many uh, wars they've fought and how many millions have been killed fighting each other. But today, it's unthinkable for them to have a conflict because they're so interlinked together because of business. They're so interlinked, the trading ties are so strong, and especially after the European Union, that it's unthinkable that these countries could ever have another war. So similarly, my dream for the subcontinent is that we resolve our difference, and our difference is only one. It's the Kashmir issue. All we want is it to be resolved according to the United Nations Security Council resolution. And this can only be resolved through dialogue. What we've seen in the world in the last 20, 30 years, that when you have conflict between nations, it only breeds more conflicts. A nation goes into war to supposedly to solve one problem, they create five other problems after that. You have a war and uh, the U.S. goes into Iraq to uh, finish off supposedly Al-Qaeda, but then you have ISIS in return. So conflicts are no way of solving problems. And I again give the example of China because President Xi specifically spoke to me. He said he also has problems with their neighbors. But all these problems are subservient to trade. Everything is subservient to investment and well-being and business. And so the same thing should apply in the subcontinent. We need to resolve our differences through dialogue, not through conflict. Because eventually, when you do not trade, when these huge, the, the subcontinent with of almost uh, 1.3 billion people. The, imagine the potential it has. It is one of the biggest markets. And the only thing, in my opinion, keeping it where it is right now, unfortunately, is that our inability to resolve our political differences through dialogue. I also feel that, uh, and I, I want to believe that we can, Pakistan can play its part in reducing the rising tensions between the United States and China. 
Some 50 years back, it was Pakistan which opened up China for the United, uh, United States. It was Pakistan who organized uh, the meeting between Henry Kissinger and the Chinese. So we hope that we can again play our part. We'd much rather be a country which uh, rather than becomes part of uh, 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 rivalries between countries, we actually become a country that brings other nations and humanity together. Um, back to Sri Lanka. We have uh, a relationship that has huge potential for both the countries. From Pakistan point of view, I think the most we can learn from Sri Lanka is in tourism. Because you have a much more advanced uh, tourism industry compared to us. Pakistan has huge, enormous potential in tourism. Uh, but it's uh, completely that potential so far is being discovered by local tourism, but not by foreign tourism, tourists. Local tourism in Pakistan has exploded. There are not enough hotels, guest houses to, to, uh, to um, accommodate the massive tourism that has gone all over the country, specifically uh, our mountain areas. For those of you who don't know, Pakistan has probably uh, one of the most unique mountain sceneries in the world. Some of the highest peaks out of the 10, 12 peaks, almost half are in Pakistan, and uh, along with the second highest mountain in the world. But it's a very, it's a, it's a virgin territory. And why tourism has uh, exploded in Pakistan? Because of the mobile phone. People go with the mobile phone, take pictures, put it on the Facebook, and that's how tourism has uh, exploded locally. Uh, but uh, I have been to a resort in uh, Sri Lanka, and the way Sri Lankan tourism has, uh, uh, is on a different level to us. So therefore, I, I brought a tourist, uh, tourism minister here, and we would like to have contacts with you in developing resorts in most of our, uh, not just mountain areas. Pakistan also has um, probably the most um, uh, undiscovered religious tourism. For people in Sri Lanka, uh, what is of great interest is the Gandhara civilization, the Gandhara Buddhist civilization. Uh, north of Islamabad was the center of, of, of the Buddhist civilization. And we have discovered various new sites for, for, for uh, Buddhist tourists to visit Pakistan. We had a, a group of South Korean monks coming in who now have uh, shown great interest in, in, a, in a trail where we would make it for, uh, for the Buddhist uh, community to actually make a trail for them all over where they can visit various shrines. Uh, there's, we just recently discovered a 40 feet sleeping Buddha in Pakistan, which is quite unique. So, uh, apart from mountain tourism and, um, and religious tourism, we, all, we have a coastline, which is uh, where we can, of course, again, learn from Sri Lanka, because you have quite advanced uh, uh, beach tourism. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, ask the business community in Sri Lanka, to participate in our CPAC project. CPAC is, a, is, a, uh, is an initiative of the BRI, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And it opens the opportunity, as our Commerce Minister just mentioned earlier, that it opens the opportunity of Sri Lankan businesses right up to Central Asia. It, it gives you an opportunity of connecting from Gwadar, which is the, 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 the port, right up to uh, uh, Uzbekistan and the Central Asian states. And this is the connectivity which uh, Pakistan offers, along with, in CPAC, we have these special economic zones, which, gives, which give incentives to businesses to, uh, uh, to um, set up industry there. So I um, invite the Sri Lankan businesses, investors, businessmen, you can, um, you can come over to Pakistan and we'll, we'll be hosting you. Uh, meanwhile, 
my, we brought our Pakistan business community, top businessmen here, who will be interacting with you and discussing various ways uh, where, which would be of mutual benefit to both, both of us, both the countries. Uh, I again thank the Prime Minister for inviting me uh, to Sri Lanka. I, I extend my invitation to you, Mr. Prime Minister. We look forward to seeing you. Um, and finally, about cricket. I saw the evolution of uh, Sri Lankan cricket team from a non-test playing country into uh, a country that actually won the World Cup in my hometown, Lahore. And um, I never thought I would see that happen. But the, the emergence of the Sri Lankan cricket team was actually, uh, for us in the subcontinent, a source of great pride. Because it, it meant that you know, it was another team which uh, could challenge the best. And yes, the answer about more interaction in sporting relationship, yes. Because nothing w improves the standard in, in, in countries more than when you have countries playing each other in, in various uh, uh, sports. Name, number one, cricket, because this is a passion in both the countries. But in Pakistan, our squash uh, teams have been of very high quality and of course a hockey team. So we would, uh, we would start our interaction in these areas too. Later on, of, of course, I'm going to a sports event, so I'll talk more about it there later on. I again thank you. I want to uh, thank our Ministry of Commerce and uh, our Foreign Office for organizing this event. Thank you.